Diamond Dallas Page, before we do anything, I want to take you back, and you can look right here at what happened last week on this very television program. All of us thinking the Macho Man, Randy Savage. Well, we didn't know exactly where he was coming from, but we found out in a big hurry. Well, it's obvious Macho. I can't even call him Macho. Savage Smack. Up from behind and nailing you, you are down on the canvas, and all of a sudden, yeah, they're big men. Hall, Nash, Savage, all members of the NWO. But take a look at this. This is unbelievable. They actually painted your back, NWO, and then the Macho Man Randy Savage, big man with you out, decides to go up to the top of the ring post and give you that devastating elbow slam. Take a look at it right here. That's the drop that, that did it all. Dallas Page, your thoughts on what's happened not only tonight, but over the past few weeks. I can sense that this crowd and people all over the world are getting behind you. They know. They know who the real deal is. Like I said before, in watching that video, obviously Macho snapped. Savage snapped. He's had his mind, mind poisoned. If you're that much of a savage, snap in to this. And then Polly does the Polly walk down the stairs, comes over to me and says, are you going to go to the ring? I did get my ass handed to me by Dusty. I got fired because I got in the backstage uh, verbal altercation with Diamond Dallas Page. Just to be clear, I have nothing personal against Vince Russo. Terry Funk took us to a karaoke place, and he said, after these people are Japanese mafia. And there's Bruno in the opposite corner, and he's dancing. And I think, you son of a... And the house the phone, and it was Jim Cornette. And nobody knows. I, th I think this is the first time I've said this, actually. Hey, y'all. This here's Grant Fletcher. Thanks for tuning in to episode 62 of the 69-Minute Eargasm with the quintessential stud muffin, Joel Gertner. Joel, how's it going? Going good, man. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I'm doing doing great, actually. I, I know I sound kind of rough right now. Um, the uh, cool weather, it's December 15th as we're recording this. The cool weather is finally starting to blow through. Um, oh, is that right? Yeah, down, so. down, down there in the swamp, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So it is the season where, where, for your voice to sound a little gravelly. Sweating and shiver. It's getting a little nippy, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, got down to the, uh, you know, the low 50s. It's uh, practically frigid <laughs> down here for us. <laughs> that's great about a week from now next saturday it's going to be i want to say uh high of 29 low of 15 <laughs> we always talk about this like you know we're having this call and we talk <laughs> about the juxtaposition of how terrible it is up there in the winter and how terrible it is down here in the summer uh -huh. um it's just you know it, it, grass is always greener i suppose yeah 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 Unless, unless you're in Scotland, because right. I, I was on a UK tour like five years ago, and I saw like parts of like northern England near the Scottish border, and I can't imagine grass being any greener than what I saw. I'm pretty sure they paint it. I think that's a uh, uh, that's a, a work for all the Americans that come over. Right. It's can't possible. be true. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I believe I believe in works. I don't believe in as many shoots as I do works. I guess that makes me a conspiracy theorist. Well, it just means you work in the wrestling business. There you go. Wait, okay, hold on. So uh, let's let's do this then. All right, um, Montreal screw job shoot or work? That's a work. That's the best angle going. That's that's the greatest of all time. That's so legendary. It's that, like Neil Armstrong didn't walk on the moon, and the Montreal screw job was a work. At least one of those things is a work, yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, look, like, I got a 50-50 shot of work or not work on both of them, and at least one of them is a work. <laughs> like two days, the first one don't count. What's a, yeah, of course, of course. You know, I mean, what? okay, what else is something that um, that people think might have been a shoot, but it was actually a work? The pipe bomb. Was the pipe bomb a shoot, shoot or a work? The CM Punk pipe bomb? Yeah, yeah. It's a work. And the it had Joey to have been a work. Work. It's I all a it's predicated on a con. 
Right. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it was live on the show. So I don't know. What else? What else is out there? I'm not really sure. Um, the, you know, the moon landing, it's I, honestly like I'm a futurist and I believe in technology and modern medicine. Like I'm a futurist. So I'm not going to say I think it is possible we could go to the moon. And I think, you know, as, as much as I am willing to, you know, listen to alternate sides of a story and, and, and entertain conspiracy theories, and so many of them actually are true and have validity to them. But honestly, the moon landing probably did. But here's my question with that, is that how come we go to the moon in 69, the greatest achievement of all time, something that, you know, it, it was talked about just 10 years earlier in jest that it could ever happen on the honeymooners and bangs, zoom, I'm going to send you to the moon. Like nobody's ever going to the moon. And then within years, we go to the moon. But do you realize we went to the moon in 69? Haven't been back, but we went to the moon in 69, but we didn't get wheels on luggage until 1970. Until 1970, it took so that you're not carrying your luggage around so that you can wheel it. But a year before they ever put wheels on luggage, they actually send a bunch of human beings up to the moon and they come back alive. That's the part of me that wonders why certain things happen, happen at certain times, happen in a certain order, and the whole logic and logistics. Because I do believe it's very possible, it probably is the case that we went to the moon. That one very well could be a shoot. But how come so many things that could have happened before that happened after it? Well, Joe, you do know we did go back to the moon, though. When? Uh, let's see. Apollo 12, 14, no, those are all 15, I 16. All that's bullshit. Now, the first one. <laughs> didn't they make a movie? Wait, they made a movie about what? The first one? I don't know. Uh, I'm sure they the have. Apollo 13, true. they made a the movie about that all, one. The rest of them are all ribs. And shame yeah. on you. For buying into it, and <laughs> <laughs> so it is to go to the moon. I can't believe we did it once. Yeah, yeah, it's like I caught a record bass. Yeah, no, I did it twice actually. I caught a record <laughs> bass twice. You caught the biggest bass you've ever caught in your life. Yeah. I uh, see. Here's a, here's where you and I differ. Is I think we did because there were a lot of people in on the whole moon landing thing. And how, like, how many times have you heard of a secret being kept between three people, let alone that many people? Yeah, no, you know? three people. <laughs> how many Telephone. how many quote unquote Telephone. secrets are there actually in the wrestling business anymore? How about this one? I got one for you. Here, yeah. figure this out. I once bowled three hundred and one. Okay, is that wait? Are, is, is that possible? Are you saying that you did? Because I um, I mean, I don't want to tell you I don't believe you, but I am going to tell you that the a perfect game is three hundred. So. Right. I'm not a great bowler. I didn't bowl 300. Uh, neither am but, I. But, 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 I know a guy who bowled 301. You know how? So he bowled 300 and he won the game is what you're saying? He was, it was five people bowling and he was the one with the highest score, obviously, because like you said, you can't get any higher than 300. So he defeated his four opponents. So he bowled 300 and won. Yeah. Yeah. See what? And so anything's possible. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, no, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I guess yeah, I stand corrected. Anything is possible. You know, if you can dream it, you can do it. We're going to turn this into a, a motivational speaker uh, podcast, by the way. We hey, it's been a minute, man. What, what have you been up to? What are you doing? I'm trying to figure out why we park on driveways and drive on parkways and stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm doing the thing, man. You know me. I'm, you know working a little bit in wrestling and a little bit here and a little bit there and yeah. uh, you know i'm easy to find but i'm kind of hard to nail down and i'm you know, i'm a real simple guy i'm just i'm kind of complicated and uh you know i don't know man life gives me dilemmas i turn them into lemonade and like it's you mm -hmm. know it's just you know yeah look I, I, you know, and, and i've been <laughs> in the game for over 30 years and it's not easy being green you know what i mean no no it is not it is not hey i did a um Actually, you know what? Before I get into that, let's talk about this because I want to bring something up that I thought was actually pretty cool. Um, so if you've noticed, if you follow us on the socials, especially on Instagram, we've been posting these uh, just little video clips um, 
you know, with content from the shows, you know, just to, to let people sample it. It's a thing that's become more popular lately that, um, you know, people are, are doing now for podcasts and YouTube and things like that, these types of clips. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to start making them for us. So I did that, and I've just been kind of going in random order, letting people sample the fair, as it were. So we got a, we got a good variety of, of episodes under our belt, right? And yeah. um, I did one for our episode with Johnny Candido, who really talked a lot about his brother, Chris Candido, on the show. And we posted it, and somewhere along the way, we got a, a, a comment. Did you see this? I think I told you about it. Did you actually see it on the Instagram? No, I don't think so. It's at 69 Minute Eargasm, by the way. Uh, if you're not following it, you should be checking it out. But we got a uh, a comment from a guy by the name of Dennis Knight, whom most of our listeners would probably oh, you know, know what better. I did, yeah, I did see that. That was really cool to see. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was really cool. It was, probably would know him better as Midian uh, in the WWE. And I just want to read here. Chris was one of, of my first brother partner's most important friend. We met in Memphis in 90 and remained one of my favorite people to this day. So much so. I tattooed his name on me. Also, one of my favorite memories was with him in Puerto Rico. Um, let's see. Also winning the WWF tag titles at MSG, et cetera, et cetera. So really cool uh, little just like remembrance that we got there on the social. So I think that was, that was just uh, an awesome thing I wanted to share with our, our listeners here. Yeah, that was fun to see. Yep. And really, sure. uh, you know, I do those too. If anybody uh, needs a, a video clip, video works, et cetera, done for... Um, you know, their podcast or whatever, you can hit me up at Grant L. Fletcher on the social. I did a, um, a horror con a little under a month ago, a few weeks ago. Uh, that was a lot of fun. We had, uh, we had JBL there. Um, kind of a loose connection there, but for the Acolytes. I think people kept asking him, like, why are you even here at this horror con? And he was like, I don't, I don't know, I'm just here. But, uh, but he's awesome, man. The second time I'd ever worked with him. And, uh, you know, really nice guy, really easygoing, uh, pretty much up for, for whatever. Uh, I think if you ever have the chance to meet JBL at a, a convention or something like that, you definitely need to do it. He's so he's full of a lot of really great stories. Yeah, he's a uh, he's a good guy. He's always been good to me. Um, he's a uh, you know self made and uh, he's just he's had an amazing life and 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 done a lot of great things in in a few different arenas. And uh, he's just a powerful guy, force to be reckoned with. Uh, and like I say, every time I've been around him, every time we've talked, every time we've worked together, uh, just a super nice guy. I think, um, was the first night you ever met him uh, at the, the one night stand pay-per-view? Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. That was uh that was a big night, you know, in the, uh, the lore of JBL and the lore of Meanie. Um, yeah. Whatever. So anyway. Yeah. Same night that he stuck his shoe pretty much, you know, up my butt and, uh, <laughs> Brushing my teeth with his shoelaces. I didn't, the way he I didn't mention that. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't. I, bring I, it up. I didn't feel, you know what? But it was per, It was so pro, though. It was like I didn't feel a thing. And you know, if you were to tell me that that was just adrenaline and the excitement of working for WWE, then that's fine. Yeah. You know, maybe the most painful thing in the world, and maybe I just didn't feel it. But the truth of the matter is, I didn't feel it at all. People who've watched it are like, "Oh, it looked like he almost kicked you down the stairs. It looked like he kicked you right up the ass." Like. You know, how, what, was it bad? And and I'll tell everybody who listened to last, I'll say, no, it, it actually wasn't bad at all. It actually, you know, for the way it looks, it, it didn't feel anything like that. Well, you know why? It's just because you, uh, you're you so good at selling is what it is. It was your selling ability that really put it over. Yeah, you have to be. You know, I, I like to, you know, if I'm trying to get out of doing the dishes any given night, I'll sell something, you know what I mean? Some old injury or just, hey, I've got this or I've got that. And if you can sell real well, you know, it's a good, uh, it's a sympathy play. You can get out of, I don't know, man, like the litter box, feeding the cat, doing the dishes. There's a handful of household chores that, you know, so if anybody, the same way, if you want to hit up Grant because you need a video for your podcast, <laughs> I'll tell you that if you need an excuse for your wife and if you need to know how to play kind of the domestic game to your uh, advantage, I'm uh, available for, um, for uh, life hacks and pro tips there because I'm really good at it. You could probably, yeah, I mean, uh, so what you do is you're like, oh, the old neck injury is... uh is is acting up again and that's it huh that's an easy one i like to keep a neck brace in the bathroom like in a medicine cabinet with a bow tie and whatever and just kind of slip it's almost like clark kent it's almost like the phone booth like you go into the bathroom not wearing a neck brace you know because wife's just asking maybe go do the dishes and then but when you come out you know and whatever you do whatever you have to do in there you know what i mean and take it like it number one number two number, like take advantage number three whatever you want to do brush your yeah. teeth and then put the neck brace on come out with the bow tie neck brace it's got to be on point style wise 
Obviously, the bow tie and the stocking around the neck. Make sure you have a stocking around the neck brace. Don't just wear any old one. And where, where, and these are available, by the way. If you need one, DM me uh, at Stud Muffin Says on Twitter. Yeah. Um, and they're not very expensive at all. I mean, I make a decent, you know, I make good coin off of it, but like, you know, you won't be out much at all. But I, you know, depending on your, you know, if you have zero disposable income, then don't do it. I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, it's Christmas time and everything. But if you have a few bucks, I mean, it's well worth it. Uh, it's actually a bargain at twice the price. So what you do is you go into the bathroom. On goes the neck brace, on goes the bow tie, you come out, you're limping, you got a bad knee, <laughs> and, and you're selling, yeah, you just do the thing, you know, you sell. See, but you had to, you had to learn the hard way, because, I mean, I know you'd been chastised before for not selling enough, right? Ah, uh, they thought I didn't sell Killer Kowalski's claw enough. Is that what, is that what you're referring to? Well, I'm thinking about that, but there had to have been another time at some point, right? What, well, uh, hold on, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. What happened with the claw? I just want to know. That's the one that always, when somebody says something about not selling enough, that's the one that sticks in my own craw about me to this day, because I don't know if it was just something that somebody said about it because Kowalski was there and they wanted to just as a, and he deserves every credit, every accolade, every like he deserves it. I'm not saying he doesn't. He's a legend and at the time who was I? But I you know, I didn't think that I mailed my performance in. I thought I did my best to sell the claw, but I guess either, you know, it I didn't or it was perceived that I didn't or again, you know, as a way of kind of um, you know, showing respects to Kowalski it was said that I didn't in front of him. And, and I guess, uh, you know, and of course I agreed, Oh, you know, I'm sorry. I, you know, if I didn't, I'm sorry, but, um, but yeah, he put the claw on me in, uh, in the Boston area and, uh, and I sold it. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I don't even think I've seen video of it. I was going to say, I mean, was that, that wasn't that, for that, a that TV or work. Yeah, I don't know. I can't remember if it was for a spot that aired on TV or if it was just kind of at the end of the match or whatever, like I have dark. I don't know. But I, I don't even want to watch it. I'm afraid, not that I'm afraid, <laughs> it, but like, I don't know. We oh, might set the record straight. You know, this could be the whole JFK back into the left type thing. Maybe you did, you know? Dude, I'll sell like if my fingernail comes a little, like I'll set, like I'll sell at the drop of a hat. So. Yeah. Anytime somebody's like, when, like you just brought up, you didn't sell it. The one, it just a red light goes on, and it just, it's like a arcade, it's like a pinball machine on tilt. And yeah. I'm like, not selling enough. Oh, the Kowalski thing. It just, it's always gonna be from 25 years. <laughs> it's ago, just in your was, psyche. It's always gonna be. Oh, I didn't sell enough. It must have been that one time for Kowalski when they said I didn't sell enough for Kowalski and that was the claw and that was Kowalski and it was his move and it was his finisher and I'm just a manager and I'm a heel and I should have sold it like, you know, I died seven times and, you know, and I thought I sold it like I died five or six times, you know, but um, I don't know. All right, I'm going to put out the appeal right now. If anyone out there knows where we can find it or if you have the clip of Joel Gertner having the claw applied to him by Killer Kowalski, let us know. Hit me up. Hit me if up on Twitter know, or on Instagram I, at Grant L. Fletcher. Let me know. I want, I want to see dude, it. We're going to put it up somewhere. I, can see it. I don't think I want to see it again. It could That's be on fire. Avert your eyes. Yeah. Mute the page if you have to. Mute the account if you have to because <laughs> it's going out. <laughs> but I want to see it. You're going to be first, the first guy ever to block his own podcast social media pages. <laughs> You know, sometimes I think you do on certain day, given days and you just unblock it. You're just blocking us and unblocking us. Over <laughs> Depending upon your mood. <laughs> yeah. I don't sell for the page enough. Right. That's that's what it is. That's what it is. That's where you're saving up your energy. Every quarter century, somebody like now from now on. Oh, you didn't sell enough. Oh, fuck. It. What? Kowalski or my own page for the podcast? See, now, now you're competing with Kowalski for having the top title of what I think about when somebody says I don't sell enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, there we are. You know what? We're going into 2023, um, pondering life's great I, mysteries. I do sell those neck braces. I do. Twitter. You sell the neck, hey, hey, between the neck braces and the cameo, someone can have themselves a very Merry Christmas and a Happy Hanukkah. You know, the cameos, which when I first started doing them like five or six years ago, um were i think 40 bucks um 
you know, and again, bargain at twice the price because what do you think inflation has been in the last five or six years? So it's not like, but, but, but not to toot my own horn, but those cameos are going for 69 now. I was going to say they should be $69. They should be $69.69 if we're being real. I might do it. You know what? I might, I might do that. I might yeah. do that. I might do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I might well, do that. get it now before the price goes up. That's all I'm telling, saying to everybody else. I'm going to do it after the podcast launches. <laughs> Good. I hope you do. Uh, I am. I'm going to say that. Before this goes live, it's going to be $69. You know what? You missed your opportunity. Sorry you couldn't hear us uh, recording this live. That's it. One percent increase in time for January 1st, just like your lease. It's going up 1%, and you just got to deal with it. Yeah. Y'all, that's, uh, well, like you said, just like the lease. That's the way of life. That's the way it is, man. Yeah, lease on life. <laughs> yeah you know we're, i was talking about the the horror con earlier i think our guest on this episode really has a, a a good connection to the horror con scenario uh because they were in a movie called the devil's rejects well yeah i don't know i see, I think, you, uh, yeah. I see the segue i mean i did a horror con with dan house and i think there's a lot of crossover there with uh wrestling fans and oh, uh, convention easy like well up here in new jersey we've got chiller theater and uh, and they're good for at least a wrestler or two every time they run, and I think they're every six months. Yeah, but uh, I get it. No, you're right. I think there's a lot of crossover between, and, and a lot of fans that I've spoken with um, on social media and, and in person. Um, I happen to know and enjoy both genres intensely. You know, there are a lot of big time, hardcore, lifelong wrestling fans who also love the horror film genre. Yeah, it's true. It's got a very, very passionate following, as does wrestling. And our, uh, our guest knows all about it. Dude, you know, our guest is actually, a what's that? How about you think I can't sub? You think I can't segue? As <laughs> do action films. Yes, one hundred percent. You know, one hundred point one hundred percent. Right, sixty nine, sixty nine. Like, take that hundred yeah. and add a point one hundred. Right. Right now, yeah, that's what, uh, you read my mind. I don't know how you, how you did it, but you do it over and over again. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, he's a he's a legend of the business, a Hall of Famer, multiple time world champion, and in the movie High Heat, which you have seen because you have special exclusive access. I have only seen the trailer. It looks really good though. It looks like a uh, Taken meets Die Hard type of thing. It's got Don Johnson in it as well. It looks pretty cool. What what do you think of the movie? I liked it. I thought it was really cool. And I thought our guest does an outstanding job. I think he really killed it. Nailed it. I can't wait to see it. It looks like uh, a lot of fun. Um, I think everybody should check it out. It is, as of right now, as of this episode dropping, it is available on digital, on demand, and in theaters. Y'all be sure you subscribe to the show so that you never miss an episode. Make sure you're following all of our accounts on social media. He's Joel Gertner, I'm Grant Fletcher, and this is Diamond Dallas Page. You've been around the world, beat everybody twice. You have championships on top of championships. You are a WWE Hall of Famer. You are the one and the only inimitable Diamond Dallas Page. Dallas, how are you? Unstoppable, bro. How about you? <laughs> doing great. Doing great. In the green room, you said the same thing. It's, thank you for taking the time. I really uh, do appreciate it. Um, tell me, man, growing up, um, how early were you exposed to pro wrestling? You know, a lot of our listeners, they're going to know a lot about what they've seen you do on camera. They're going to know about your history, and they're going to know about your achievements and accomplishments. But what they might not know uh, a little bit about kind of your personal life, um, mainly where it revolves around wrestling, though. Sure. Um, you watching as a kid, uh, if that was a thing for you. Uh, and, and as far as TV, yeah, and going to shows, stuff like that. So if you don't mind getting into it a little bit and uh, and telling us about kind of the formative years of Dallas Page. A lot of people probably won't even know the fact that <clears throat> I actually tried to wrestle when I was 23 in 1979. Uh, as a kid, 
you know, I thought wrestling, you know, I liked wrestling. I was drawn to it. But as a teenager, it became something I loved. And, you know, obviously Bruno San Martino was the man. When I was 17, that would have been like 72, 73, um, 1972 or 73. Uh, the big angle with Larry Zabisco would come out of that. Um, uh, Handsome Jimmy Valiant was one of my favorites. I love the Valiant brothers. I love Captain Lou Albano, uh, Bruno, I mean, uh, Classy Freddie Blassie. A uh, friend of mine, uh, who we're, you know, we both play basketball and, uh, you know, coming out of <clears throat> high school, um, you know, I started telling people, you know, like, I'm going to become a professional wrestler. Of course, they laughed, you know, and nobody believed it. And we, I had no idea I was going to do that. And uh, me and Shipley and Gary Rossi went to the Asbury Convention Center. And it was a, a building that's out over the ocean. I mean, old school, no AC, uh, hold probably about 3,000 people. And, you know, after the intermission, I said, let's walk around to the outside because a lot of the guys are going to they'll, they'll come out to get a breather because there's no AC in that building. And there was Greg the Hammer Valentine. So I yelled up at him, hey, Hammer, how you getting to professional wrestling? He had two words for me, fuck off. And he walked back inside. <laughs> and he, me and Hammer have become buddies since then. Hell, we went to Afghanistan together at one point. And he swears he didn't do that. He did it. It's something a friggin' 23-year-old kid was never going to forget. Hammer told me to fuck off. You know, uh, so the crazy part and how it actually led for me to actually start training at 23, you know, once a week in Jersey City happened because the one and only Gorilla Monsoon was the main event that night. <clears throat> and there's Gorilla in his tights that covered his wrists to his ankles, that one big tight suit that he would wear. After the match was over, he didn't walk down the aisle. He got out of the ring. There was a bag right there, you know, a, a, you know his, probably the stuff he brought his regular clothes in, put his gimmick in. And he started leaving with the people. And I was like, oh, my God, he's leaving with everybody. Let's go ask him. So we start, you know, bothering him. Grill, how do we get a professional wrestling? How do we get a professional wrestling? Come on, man. No, we're not going to go away. No, we want to be wrestlers, man. We need. And uh, when he finally got to his car, he said, write down this number. And we don't know if it's a real number or not, but, hey, we're writing it down. And his name, his name was Tito Torres. He was a job guy who was from, I want to say, Puerto Rico. And, you know, when you're a job guy and you're on TV, in that independent world, you know, you can draw a couple hundred people. So the bottom line is I go up there, we make the phone call. He gives us the address. It's in Jersey City. We're in fuck. We're on the Jersey Shore, so it's like an hour, you know, hour and ten minutes to get up there. And it's in a, it's on a street that's got stores on it that are all little rundown stores, and some of them are vacant. And his ring is inside this building. You now it's called a strip center, but really tiny old school strip center. The ring is in the store. There might be a foot, foot and a half on each side where the, you know, the ring goes almost to the wall. You know, it's like a 16 foot ring or whatever. And that's where he would train us once or twice a week. Within two months, he's got us doing independent shows. Like, I don't know a wrist lock from a wristwatch. And this guy, 
Tito, who I don't can't understand most of the words he says, I'd say, what did he say? Grab his leg, grab my leg, grab my leg. However he would say it, very hard to understand. And uh, this is really crazy. I'm telling this story, and we're about to talk about high heat because it actually segues into that. I got to look this up to see exactly so I can uh, tell you tell you what I'm going to the whole story. So he, I have three matches. I don't really know anything, but I'm having these matches, going out there, getting the littlest bit of experience. And the one guy that I end up wrestling on the third match that I end up doing, he, I, I, he's talking to me in Carney. I can't understand kind of what he's saying. I don't know how to speak Carney yet. And I end up getting him pissed off and he sips me a bunch of times and throws me over the top rope. And I came down on my bad leg that got hit by a car when I was 12 years old. And I thought I tore my ACL. I was in massive amount of pain, went in there, finished it, did the job, got out. The knee is, is really hurting. Uh, I go see the doctor. The doctor tells me, yeah, you just got a strain. Just take off a month or two and you'll be fine. Go ahead and go back. That crazy wrestling shit. Well, at that time, I got an opportunity to run a little nightclub, not nightclub, a little rock and roll bar that was at the bottom of a rest, you know, restaurant was on the first, second floor. The the little bar that they were going to turn into a rock and roll bar was on the, the bottom floor. <clears throat> and I had so much fun because I've been in the bar business since I was 17. I'd done everything but run a place. So now I'm running this place. And the booze, the bras, and the party take me to a whole different spot. And I end up going from one club down to Texas, down to there, back to Texas, back to Asbury Park, run a club one block from the Stone Pony. And I pretty much forgot about professional wrestling, that dream, until I saw WrestleMania. And I was so mad at myself that I didn't put the time in, didn't put the work in, I didn't pay my dues. I was so mad at myself, I stopped watching wrestling altogether. It came up, I, I hated wrestling, you know, fuck wrestling. And then I was flicking the channels and there's Gorilla Monsoon with this dude with a leather coat and a boa and a crazy do-rag and these crazy sunglasses. And I'm like, who is that guy? It was Jesse Ventura. I go, this guy's amazing. And the first guy to come out of the you know of the curtain is a guy with a friggin' bag over his shoulder, Fu Manchu, long black hair. I'm like, who is this guy? Look at his walk, the confidence, the swag. And then I watch him in the ring. I'm like, oh my god, did I miss something? Because his shit looks real. And then I heard him cut a promo, and I'm like, okay, who is this guy? Jake Snake Roberts. I was sucked back in. Now, to tell you how crazy that story is, I'm on the set of High Heat. I'm at catering, and a kid says to me, Diamond, did you ever hear of Tito Torres? Now, my brother-in-law, Paul, sends me this clipping that would have been from a program that was in another wrestling, like little, they make their own programs for wrestling. And on the top of this thing, it says big time wrestling at the West Indian Social Club, 3340 Main Street, Hartford, Connecticut, Friday, December 7th, 1979, 8 p.m., eight big bouts, Tito Torres, the champ, versus the animal, Kervin Sullivan, versus big, handsome Dallas Page. I'm the second name on this card I have never seen before. This kid <laughs> says to me, have I ever heard of Tito Torres? And I pull this out. I go, this Tito Torres? He goes, yeah, that's my grandpa. Uh, What's the odds of that? 
<laughs> small world. And wrestling is a small circle. Too. You know, I, I if I if I keep you late on your media day, I'll have hell to pay uh, for for more than one reason. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I want to. Um, hopefully, I get a chance to pick your brain at a different time, and we can go into a little bit more about pro wrestling. But what I want to do, I've seen High Heat. Uh, it's fire. Um, you do a great job. And for people who might not know, uh, you've really been killing it and acting. Um, you know, people might have seen you, you know, in wrestling, obviously. And, and you know, you've been you're, you're such a luminary that you've extended outside wrestling with the DDP yoga. I saw you on Shark Tank and we've seen you command football stadiums. And uh, at StarCast, I was the producer assigned to your DDP yoga session, and it was the easiest gig I've ever had because as a supreme yogi, you just commanded that small room, and, and it was filled with a couple hundred people from yeah, the crazy. list of them. <laughs> wouldn't know it that they were do that you you inspired them to to do these kind of motions and and you know I've I've, I've never seen you know so much come from people who are just kind of trying to get in shape, kind of everyday people. You know, it wasn't like being in a wrestling locker room. It was people that just want to stay fit, learn how to be their best them. And I saw you command that small room. And then there's film, which is, you know, I've a little bit of experience, but film's entirely a different monster. And it's just amazing that you're killing it there, too. Um, but again, High Heat's a really cool project. Can you tell, you know, again, it's a, it's a predominantly wrestling-based audience that we have. Can you tell people a little bit about your character a little bit about the film and let them know why it's must see because what it is from the film and from you and your character that they can relate to and enjoy. So first of all, you have to understand that wrestling fans, you know, when it comes to action, <laughs> that's where you're going to grab them a lot because that's exactly what we do. It's all live action and women's wrestling over the last God, over the last decade is just like blossoming. And so a lot of the girls are just as good as any of the guys. And they lay it on the line because they're going out there to prove something. Well, Olga Kurienko, she's not going to disappoint anybody because her her mean streak, her fighting, uh, you know, for the screen is amazing. And I don't know, I can't tell where the, uh, the, Stunt woman comes in and she comes in because a lot of this stuff she did herself and you can tell and she looks great doing it and it does it does get vicious which again that's what wrestling fans like as for for me you know uh, playing the character Dom when it comes down to you know preparing for something like this that character has a lot of me in it. If I would have went that route, and I grew up with a lot of guys, you know, where I'm from New Jersey, down the Jersey Shore, that's where all the wise guys came during the summer. So I knew a lot of them. So if I went that route, I'm glad I didn't. But if I did, you know, that's where I put myself when I start this character and start building me into the character so that I can play it as truthful as possible. And uh, I had a lot of fun with it. I had a lot of fun with um, the subtleties of being Dom, uh, the subtleties and the fun, because when it comes down to, uh, you know, preparing for a role, I know that I'm going to, I'm going to nail my first, second take is going to definitely, unless someone else screwed up, it's good to go. And then, of course, when you nail it in the first take or two, then they're like, okay, let's try different. Let's try this. Let's try that. I was really happy to see that a lot of the my choices, the director, Zach, he actually used. And uh, I'm, it's really hard for me to watch my own stuff because, you know, if, if, if it's not good, I can't. I can't watch it. So um, I uh, I can watch this. I've watched it a couple times. <laughs> so that means to me, it was a good job. And uh, I, I, there's times where it's just funny. 
you know, more than anything, uh, getting to work with Don Johnson was one of the you know, really special moments for me. He was super cool to me. And, uh, yeah, he, you know, he pretty much enjoyed what we did together and he, and he expressed that to me. So I felt real good about that, but the overall movie itself, it's just fun. And if you have a, if you, if you want to have a good time watching a movie, I think wrestling fans in general will not be disappointed. I think they're really going to dig it. Real quick wrap up question. Cause I know you again, a tight window on your junket and I need to keep you on time on your media day. Um, but um, if Dom were one of the boys, and he was on the road. Um, who do you think he'd be friends with? And uh, how do you think Dom would fare um, in in the act in in the universe of professional wrestling that hardcore fans who have followed it for however many decades uh, are familiar with in the real world? Uh, he definitely would have traveled with Diamond Dallas Page, <laughs> Ke- <laughs> Kevin, Na- <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Nash. Uh, I think Stone Cold Steve Austin would get a huge kick out of him. Uh, he don't drive with many people, but he would, he would drive with me. So he would definitely uh, drive with Dom. Uh, but Kevin Nash would probably want to be one of his best friends. Uh, real life <laughs> as well. And, you know, kind of remember, Kevin Nash also has played Vinny Vegas. He's been a gangster himself at times, <laughs> and uh, he would, I think he'd really love him. Tell people how they can see the movie. You know, I don't know. I just know it's on, you know, I, I know that, I, I don't even know where it's coming from, so I can't give that an honest answer. <laughs> okay. You know, so, well, we'll make so, sure we're gonna, we're, Yeah, I'll, I'll get all the info. It, it's funny. Um, I'm going to let you go. Dallas, I'd be honored to uh, to talk with you some more about your life and wrestling. Well, you know, my schedule's really crazy jam, but if we can find time coming in a new year, we'll figure it out and we'll get something together, okay? Cool. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the inimitable Diamond Dallas Page. Diamond Dallas Page. Thank you so much. It's been your pleasure. And well, 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 you are going to get a well-documented account of all of the goings-on for this day, Friday, December 16th, in pro wrestling history. And that account is going to be coming to us from our librarian, our archivist, our historian, our professor, the one and the only Mr. John Santosi. Thank you, Joel. We have a busy day, December 16th, so let's uh, get right to it. Way back in 1880 in Boston, Massachusetts, John McMahon, no relation to Vince, defeated H.M. Duffer to win the American Collar and Elbow title. Uh, sad day in 1917 in Humboldt, Iowa, Frank Gotch died from kidney, kidney failure at the age of 39. 1941 in Mexico City, Black Guzman or Guzman defeated Tarzan Lopez to win the NWA World Middleweight title. 1949 in Houston, Vern Gagne defeats Leo Newman and wins the NWA Texas Heavyweight title. 1952 in San Francisco, Fred Atkins and Ray Eckert defeat Ben and Mike Sharp to win the San Francisco version of the NWA World Tag Team Championship. 1954 in Kansas City, Kansas, Ray Vilmer defeated Joe Dusick and he wins the NWA Central States title. 1955 in Honolulu, Al Lolatai defeats George Bolas, the Zebra Kid, and he wins the NWA Hawaii Heavyweight title. 1962 in St. Paul, Minnesota, Mr. High and Mr. Low, who were Doug Gilbert and Vicki Steinborn, defeated Art and Stan Nielsen to win the AWA World Tag Team titles. 1963 in Indio, California, Edouard Carpentier wins the WWA World Wrestling Association Los Angeles version World Heavyweight title by forfeit when Bearcat Wright decided not to show up. 1966, St. Joseph, Missouri, Mike DiBiase defeats the Viking and wins the NWA Central States Championship. 
1970 in Nashville, Mighty Atlas and Oni Wiki Wiki defeated Bobby Hart and Lorenzo Parente for the Mid-America version of the NWA Tag Team Championship. The same year in Mobile, Alabama, Bob Kelly wins the NWA Gulf Coast Heavyweight title by defeating the Wrestling Pro. <clears throat> 1970 in Honolulu, Billy Robinson defeats Dick Byer, the Destroyer, and he wins the Hawaii version of the NWA North American title. 1971 in Tampa, Florida, Ole Anderson defeated Jack Briscoe, and he wins the NWA Florida television title. 1972 in Calgary, George Gordienko and Superhawk defeat Danny Babich and Michelle Martel for the Stampede International Tag Team titles. 1975, Rock Riddle and John Tolis defeat Mickey Doyle and Mondo Lopez to win the NWA America's Tag Team title in Los Angeles. 1977, still in Los Angeles, the Canadian, yep, Roddy Piper wins the NWA America's title by defeating Chavo Guerrero, Sr. 1978, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Bobby Eaton and George Goulas defeat Gypsy Joe and Tojo Yamamoto and win the NWA Mid-America Tag Team titles. 1983, in St. Petersburg, Florida, Mike Rotunda defeats Greg Valentine in a tournament final and he wins the vacant NWA Florida Heavyweight title. 1986, in Tampa, Florida, Hacksaw Higgins and Kareem Muhammad defeat the fabulous one Steve Kern and Stan Lane for the Florida version of the NWA United States Tag Team titles. Uh, the same year, 1986, in Orlando, Bad News Allen defeats the Falcon and becomes the final NWA Bahamas heavyweight champion. 1988 in Tokyo, Terry Gordy and Stan Hansen win the vacant All Japan Pro Wrestling Univi Unified Tag Team titles. 1990 at Starcade, WCW, St. Louis, Missouri, Lex Luger defeats Stan Lane and wins the NWA U.S. Championship. Uh, NWA Tag Champs Doom with Teddy Long fought Barry Windham and Arn Anderson to a draw and a street fight. And in the Pat O'Connor Memorial Tag Team Tournament Finals, the NWA U.S. Tag Champs Rick and Scott Steiner defeat the great Muta and Mr. Saito. Uh, the NWA champ on the same show, Sting, pins the Black Scorpion in a steel cage match. Of course, the Black Scorpion was the nature boy, Rick Flair. 2006 in Caguas, Puerto Rico, Carlito defeats John Heidenreich and wins the WWC Universal Heavyweight title. 2007 in Pittsburgh, Edge defeats Batista and The Undertaker to win the WWE Championship. And finally in 2018 at WWE Tables, Ladders and Chairs in San Jose, California, Dean Ambrose defeats Seth Rollins to win the Intercontinental title. And Asuka beats champion Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair to win the SmackDown women's title in a table, ladders, and chairs match. And that wraps it up for December 16th. That is indeed a lot of title changes and a lot of history on the 16th of December in professional wrestling throughout the years. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Joel. We'll have more 69 minutes here, guys. Let's see. Two salad nisuas and one striped bass. Bon appetit. Good evening, chef. Good evening, husband. You better be ready to get real busy. We are all booked for tonight. The kitchen is now closed. Hello? They're coming for you. I owe a lot of money. How much, Frey? 1.2. You don't know these guys. They're not going to walk away from this. I got 10,000 bucks for the person who killed them. 
Whose blood is that? What's going on? Don't, don't, don't open the door, right? Don't. I used to work for the KGB. You're a spy. I'm a chef. Send me everyone you've got. I don't care about the cost. Just make it happen. See you soon. We'll hit him from both sides. Her. It's a her? It's a her. Can we help you? Yeah, past your bedtime. He is tougher than he looks. Well, he looks geriatric, I hope so. It's a little below the belt, don't you think?